Alhamdulillah, the academic program, we have a BA, which is accredited, and an MA program, which is accredited. Both of them are rigorous programs, and our students are going to many, many wonderful places. We have people now at Oxford, at Harvard, at Georgetown Law, Davis Law, Urbana-Champaign, Claremont Colleges. Some of them are going into the Islamic teaching at the Islamic schools. Um, but this is not a seminary. It's really important for people to understand that. It's a liberal arts college. Uh, we, we do have people that will go on to study Islamic subjects, but there are other things. We also see the importance of the body and the development of the body, especially with young people. And so we have incorporated a Sunnah sports tradition at Zaytuna College. So we have uh, horseback riding, we have swimming, we have archery. And we actually are part of the uh, collegiate archery association, so we can compete with other schools. We are building a really beautiful studio. In the studio, we're going to be having online courses done at a very high professional level, one in formal logic and the other in constitutional law, taught by our own faculty members. There's also this extraordinary gardens that we're developing here with the Z-Cell, which is for sustainable living. So we have some permaculture experts. We're already growing fruit and vegetables that our students are eating, but we plan on having really the bulk of their fruits and vegetables coming from the property itself. And that's a very ambitious program that we hope you support. Uh, the gardens are really quite stunning already, but we're planning on really enhancing that. So I just want to, again, thank everybody for supporting Zaytuna College, for supporting uh, Z-Cell, and for supporting our students, our faculty, and our staff. So looking forward just to having your support, but also looking forward to you seeing where we're headed and the things that are in store. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with where things are going. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلواته وسلامه على أفضل خلق الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحابته ومن والاه الحمد لله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح لنا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين uh, Inshallah, we're entering into the eighth chapter from Raghab Imam Raghab Isbahani's uh, book, Tafsil al Nash'atain wa Tafsil al Sa'adatain. This is entitled Kaunul Insani Mustaslahan lid Darain. The fact that the human being is uh, been made uh, for both abodes. Like he's salihun for both abodes. It's, he, he's an appropriate creature for both of these two abodes. The, the abode of this world and the abode of the next world. So he says, رضي الله عنه, الإنسان من بين الموجودات مخلوق خلقة تصرح للدارين وذلك أن الله تعالى قد أوجد ثلاثة أنواع من الأحياء نوع دار الدنيا وهو الحيوانات ونوع دار الآخرة so he says that the human being amongst all created things is a creature that was created for both of the abodes. And that is because uh, if Allah has created three types of living beings. The first type is created solely for this abode, the, the abode of the, the, the lower abode. And these are the animals, hayawanat. The second type is created for the immaterial world. So the first for the material world, the second for uh, the, the, the afterlife. And these are the mala al-a'la. This is the highest assembly. 
And then the, th the third type f is for both abodes, which is the human being. For insan wasiatatun bayna jawharain, wadi'un wa huwa rahiwanat, wa rafi'un wa huwa malaika. So the human being is a means between these two, uh, these two essential types. A low type, and those are the animals, and a exalted type or high type, and those are the angels. And then he made the, um, the, so he made the animals uh, for uh, this, this uh, lower abode. He, he put us between these two. And so the animals have, they have bodily appetite. They need uh, food, nourishment, drink. Um, they were created for procreation. Also they do, they have muharash and munazah. So, so they're creatures that will vie and fight amongst each other, they'll quarrel. Um, and uh, like animals do, the animal world is a is a bloody world in reality. If, if you actually look at the animal world, I think Tennyson has an interesting take on that. So, so and also all these other aspects that are related to the be bestial realm, to the the realm of beasts. I just was watching my cat try to catch a fly. Right, so. I mean, the poor fly, what did the fly do to the cat? But that's just, that's the bestial world. It's a, and then when, when humans behave like beasts, they end up doing similar things. They invade other people's lands. They take over people's homes. They, they bulldoze them. Uh, or, or they uh, draw people into a war that they want, but, but uh, the, other, the other group might not want. But they draw them into it just so they can crush them. Right? And, they'll, and they'll kill lots of people and not really care. I mean, one of the things about the animal kingdom is at least, you know, when they kill, they kill out of necessity, generally. I mean, some cats, cats are pretty cruel. There's a theory that they're evil animals uh, because they will kind of just for sport. Uh, and then they like to play with the animal that they, the prey, their prey. But generally, animals will kill because they need to kill. And, uh, but humans, it's, it's a different story. So, so he says, so then there's the angels. So like the angels in intelligence, in knowledge, in worshiping their Lord, in sincerity, in their uh, obedience and loyalty, and things like that from noble qualities, from these higher, the akhraq al-sharifa, these, um, these noble characteristics. So now he's going to go into what is the wisdom in that? Like why would Allah create a creature that, that has both these qualities in them? They're murakkab in that way, they're compounded. So he says, so when the exalted, basically when he uh, put forward this candidate for his worship and his uh, vicegerency, his stewardship, and the cultivation of his, his earth, he prepared him uh, with those things for uh, being in his presence in the, in the afterlife, in the Jannah. So all of that, um, the wisdom, the divine wisdom behind it then uh, resulted in bringing these two powers together, these two uh, powers, the quwa al-haywaniya wa quwa al-malakiya. فَإِنَّهُ لَوْ خُرِقَ كَالْبَهِيمَ مُعَرَّنَ عَنَ الْعَقْلِ لَمَا صَلَحَ لِخِلَافَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَ وَعِبَادَتِهِ Had he been created like a beast, denuded of uh, rational thought, of intelligence, then he would not have been, uh, he would, would not have warranted the, the khilafa to be the steward, or to worship him out of 
uh, willing, in other words, out of free will. كَمَا لَمْ تَصْلُحْ لَهُ ذَارِكَ الْبَهَائِمِ be, uh, just as the animals themselves are not, they don't warrant that. They're not, it's not appropriate for them. Nor for there to be uh, in that divine presence in the afterlife uh, and in his paradise. And had he created them like angels, denuded of any bodily needs, then they would not have uh, been uh, appropriate to cultivate the earth because part of the earth's cultivation is farming and agriculture. If you don't need food, then you're not going to farm uh, the, the the world. You're not going to do those things. You're not going to build. If you if if you have no bodily needs, if you don't have uh, cold, then you're or 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 uh, need protection from heat. Then you're not going to create buildings that you need to live in. Uh, so all of the imara of the art, because that's one of the reasons Allah created the human being, was to cultivate the earth. It's not simply for ibadah. Like he gives these reasons in the Quran, and he'll, he'll get into this in, in, in the chapter where he talks about why what are the reasons that the human being has been created, because there are more than one. And that's why there are some people that are not worshipping Allah, but they are serving a purpose in the world. They're not, there's nothing sabahlala in Allah's creation. There's nothing uh, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, pointless. So he says, وَكَمَا لَمْ تَصْلَحُ لِذَارِكَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ So the angels weren't worthy of that. Uh, and when they questioned Allah, and it was, it was su'al istifham, la i'tirad, as they say, the mufassirun, it was, it was a question to understand, not a question to uh, challenge. So he said, um, Allah said, I know what you do not know. The angel, when, when they said, Are you going to put in the earth the one who sows corruption? So they were doing, according to some of the commentators, they were, they were doing analogical reasoning with, with the jinn that were here before that did all this corruption, because they had free will also. So they were asking, are you going to do this again with, with these creatures with free will? So Allah says, I know what you do not know. And for this reason, the, the, the divine wisdom uh, required that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join these two إِذَا صَحَبَ التَّعْبِيرِ I mean in, in Arabic that's, that's what it says أَنْ تُجْمَعْ لَهُ الْقُوَّةً وَفِي اعْتِبَارِ هَذِي الْحِكْمَةِ تَنْبِيهُنَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْإِنسَانِ دُنْيَوِي وَأُخْرَوِي And in consideration of this divine wisdom there is a, 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 um, a notification, there's a, there's a a calling to attention the fact that the human being is both worldly and otherworldly. One who lam yukhraq abatha, and he was not created uh, in vain. There's nothing vain about our creation. Kama nabbah Allah ta'ala ali bi qawli, afa hasibtumu annama kharaqnaakum abatham wa annakumu ilayna la turshi'un. Do you think that uh, we created you uh, in vain and that you will not be returned to God? In other words, this is just a free lunch. There's not going to be any reckoning. There's no hisab. Do you think this is all? And this is what a lot of modern people think. They think that this is purely uh, uh, just a meaningless. I mean, they'll create existential meaning, like somebody like Camille Paglia or something will say. She she talks about how important meaning is, um, but she's an atheist. So so that meaning has to be generated like the spider who generates his own abode from his body. He's the only creature, you know, at least the ones that we know. I'm not sure some scientist has found some other creature maybe, but uh, from, the, from the animals that we know, the, the spider creates his web from his own. And this is why Allah says that those who disbelieve, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا اِتَّخْذُوا بَيْتًا كَبَيْتًا عَنْ كَبُوتٍ Right? Their, their house is like the spider web's house. So they build this web of meaning, but it's all from themselves. Is that they, 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 this is the weakest of houses. In other words, if the meaning is based only on what you have generated, but in reality it's groundless, it doesn't, then it's a weak house. And this is why they go into deep existential crises when things happen that, that, uh, that undermine their, their meaning. Right? They, lose, they lose a sense 
of uh, purpose. Uh, if, if somebody's hedonistic, the same. So they could live for pleasure, but then when the taste buds go, you know, like Shakespeare says, the last stage, it's, it's uh, you know, sans taste, sans sight, sans tea, sans everything. There's nothing left. So at that stage, then the hedonism's gone, and then you have euthanasia. So they'll just kill them, because there's no purpose uh, for them. Like for us, somebody who in the, in the end stage of life, they're being purified. That's all purification. The people, the believers that go through those periods where, I mean, I saw uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadr Sagaf, years he was there and people were taking care of him and he, he was luminous. Anybody that visited him, they were all always amazed. He was luminous. Um, but, and so it was a blessing for him to be in the world like Marabd al-Hajj, the same thing. For, for the last years of his life, he, he was, uh, I mean, he slept on that. Khabta was no bed sores, uh, had an amazing scent. The people, everybody who visited him know, knows that. But, but he was being taken care of by the people. They wouldn't euthanize, euthanize somebody like that or, or any Muslim because we, we don't believe that. I mean, even our ulama wrote about the prohibition of euthanizing cats and dogs. You know, let alone a human being. I mean, there are fatwas about that, that you should take care of sick cats and sick dogs. You know, so, so it's a completely different worldview. So, so he, that, that's what he's telling us. Now, this next section is, is really quite stunning. So this is going to be analogizing and, and uh, conceptualizing the essence of the human being. So he's going to give us analogies in order for us to really understand through analogy, because it's one of the ways, one of the most important ways that human beings understand things is through analogies. Allah strikes many similitudes in the Quran, the, the amthal, and, and those are ways of driving home meaning. Even everything in the Quran about the afterlife is, uh, according to Ibn Abbas, all of it is, they're just approximations. Because there's, in reality, the afterlife is what nobody has ever seen or heard or, or never occurred to the human heart. So he said, لَيْسَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا الْأَسْمَى That's uh, Ibn Abbas said that. The, the only relationship that the afterlife has to this world is in the names. So, قَدْ ذَكَرَ الْحُكَمَاءِ لِذَاتِ الْإِنسَانِ وَقُوَّاءَ أَمْثَادًا صَوَّرُوهَا So, so the, the sages... The wise people, philosophers, lovers of wisdom, have uh, concerning the essence of the human being and the potentialities and faculties of the human being, they, ha they, have, they have struck similitudes and conceptualized them for us. فَتَمْثِيرُ كُلِّ مَا لَا يُدْرَكُ إِلَّا بِالْعَقْرِ يُتَصَوَّرُ لِلْحِسِّ so, so everything that, that can only be understood by the intelligence you have to conceptualize it with, sensor, with sensible things. That that's the, one of the ways that the intellect can grasp what it is, is by giving analogies. So you see it's analogous to this. And that's, that's why you know, one of the meanings of ta'bir yu'abbiru is to, to, to cross over, like a ma'bara is a bridge. So, so an analogy enables you to go from one point where, where you're not understanding something, and then through that analogy, you cross the bridge into understanding it. So he says, min al in order for it to approximate some understanding. وَلِلْمَلِكِ وَزِيرٌ وَصَحِبُ بَرِيدٍ وَأَصْحَبُ أَخْبَارٍ وَخَازِنٌ وَتَرْجُمَانٌ وَكَاتِبٌ وَفِي الْبَرَدِ أَخْيَارٌ وَأَشْرَارٌ So he's going to strike the, 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 the similitude of a city. So he says, when uh, the essence of the human being was in fact a microcosm, as, it, as was aforementioned, he says, it can be looked at like a city whose uh, who's, who's the, the building of which was masterful. Its, uh, its buildings were erected well. It is guarded by a, 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 
a, um, a wall surrounded. So it's surrounded by a wall. Like these are medieval towns because there was so much um, fear of invasion in, in most countries. So cities were built usually, like if you go to Fez today, there's still a wall around. If you go to Rabat, there's still a wall around the old city because they were fortified, either from foreign invasion or from people within the countries that wanted to, uh, to challenge the rulers for whatever reason. So he's saying that they, with fortified walls, <laughs> and, and its, its, its streets were, uh, were, were set out, laid out, designed. <laughs> and then its different um, neighborhoods were divided. And then the, the, uh, the, its homes were inhabited with, with uh, residents and its uh, pathways and byways were laid out and its rivers uh, were also um, set to flow and its marketplaces were opened and uh, its craftsmen were preoccupied and there was placed in it a, a, a strategic king, a king that, that is mudabbir, like he's taking care of the affairs of the city. And the king has a minister, and he also has uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the person like who's in charge of communication. And then he has uh, the, uh, like the, uh, the mukhabarat, you know, the people that are getting news and everything for him. And then he also has the treasurer, and he's got a dragoman, which is from Arabic, Tarjuman, the same as a dragoman in English, which means translator, is from Tarjuman. And in that city are good people and bad people. So th this is his analogy for the human being. So now he's going to tell us what each one of these are. So the, the craftspeople, are the seven faculties. التي يقال لها الجاذبة والماسكة والحاضمة والدافعة والنامية والقادية والمصورة. So these these faculties go back to. There's two ways to understand them. One is in relationship to the actual the physical body. So you have um, the جاذبة would be the assimilative. Right? It's what, it's, it's what when, when you take in food, for instance, it's what is pulling uh, the food. The masika is the retentive faculty, so it's what retains the good of the food. The hadima is the digestive. The dafia is the excretory, so it's excreting what's, what's not useful. The nabia is the growth, so it will, re, it will build from the materials, it will actually build uh, what's necessary. The ghadiya is, uh, is the, um, is the um, nutritive. So it's, it's what is going to take the nutrients in order to uh, engender the energy that one needs. And then the musawwira is the, um, the intellectual faculty. So these are, the, the, that, that's one. The, the second level is that each one of these also has that's in relation to the body. They also have in relation to the soul. So, so, so they're both. You can look at them from, from a bodily perspective. You can look at them from the perspective. Of, so from the perspective of the soul, the jadiba, which has, you know, in, in, in this traditional, I mean, this comes out of a, a, a well-studied tradition. So the jadiba has the quwa shahwiya and the quwa shawqiya, the jadiba. So, so the quwa shahwiya are those things that we have, the appetites that we have, and then the shawqiya are the things we desire. Like, if it's, if it's sound, it's, you, you desire good things, like knowledge and upright behavior and things like that. It's also called quwa nuzu'iya. And then you have the, 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 uh, the, um, the masika, which is, you know, what the soul retains from its experiences and from its knowledge and things like that that's useful. And then it has the, um, the hadima, you know, what, how it digests it, how it uses it. Uh, and then the dafia, what it rejects. So the quwa dafia 
is related to the quwa ghadabiya because you have dar al mafsada wa jalb al maslaha so the quwa jadiba is for the jalb al maslaha the 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 assimilative the one that desires yajdib it's it's trying to bring something to itself that has the the quwa shahwiya and then the quwa ghadabiya is related the the concupiscent soul is related to the jadiba and then the irascible soul is related to the um, dafia because it repels what's harmful to the human being. And then the, the namia is qataf lahman zakaha. It's what, it's what enables the soul to grow. And then the, um, the ghadia is what's beneficial for the soul. You ghadia soul. The Prophet said said uh, about the the wet nurse, he said, Be careful about the, uh, uh, an unintelligent wet nurse because she's giving more than just the food. Like it's going to affect the intellect as well. And it's said that Fakhruddin al Razi, uh, one of the servants who wasn't very bright, uh, suckled him. He was crying once, and so she just took him and suckled him. And. Uh, his father found out he was furious. So he knew this story of having, so whenever he would forget something, he would say, Masat al Murda. That was from the time I, <laughs> I had the, took some milk from that dullard. <laughs> so those are, the, those are the seven. So those are the, he's, he's, uh, he's basically, using them as, as an analogy for the craftsmen. Because they're the ones that do the work in the city, that, give, that, that do all the things that are necessary for the city to run. وَالْمَلِكُ الْعَقَلْ وَمَنْ بَعُهُ مِنَ الْقَلْبِ So the, the king is the heart. And, and, and the source of that, uh, sorry, the king is the intelligence. And the source of that is the heart. So, لَهُمْ قُرُوبُ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, but they don't think with them. They don't reason with them. So, so and that's why the heart is also, uh, it's uh, Imam al-Ghazali and others talk about that the heart is like a city, that, you know, there's two kings fighting for it. So, if the, if the king of light gets in, then it has inshirah, it's, it's, it has all this opening. But if the dark one gets in, then it becomes... Uh, dark. So, and then he says the minister is the quwa al-mufakkira. So the quwa al-mufakkira is, this is basically the cogitative faculty of the human being. And, and so the minister, he, he's the one that, that really does a lot of the work of the king. And that's why he's called wazir, because yahmiru awzar al-malik. He bears the burdens of the king. And, and so, like, you have that. So, yeah, you know, the, the president has the vice president, but the vice president ends up doing most of that work, right? Um, so, so, so you always have, uh, you know, your, 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 your faculty there, but then you need your, the, the, the one that helps you with that. He says that this is in the uh, midbrain, uh, which today probably would, it would be seen as the, more the, the, the neocortex. So it's actually the, the midbrain is more uh, emotion. وصاحب البريد القوة المتخيلة ومسكنه مقدم الدماغ. So and then he says the imaginative faculty. So this is this is the imagination because you had قوة المفكرة قوة المتخيلة قوة الحافظة قوة الذاكرة قوة ال الواهمة. These are these are faculties that the mind was divided into. So then he says. أصحاب الأخبار الحواس الخمس ومسكنه العضاء الخمسة. So the uh, the ones that get the news, like the spies, for the they're the the five senses. So they and they're related to these five uh, sensory organs that God's given us. And then the treasurer is at قوة الحافظة. This is the faculty of memory. ومسكنها خلف الدماغ. And that's accurate. Now we know that cerebellum is is where the memory is located. It also is, if you look at it, it's in the shape of a cashew. And for, the, for those who are interested, uh, there's a very interesting book by Scott Buchanan, it's worth reading, called The Doctrine of Signatures, which is 
the, the philosophy of, and it was very well developed in the Ottoman uh, Empire, the physicians of the Ottomans gave a lot of consideration to this. So the doctrine of signatures is that God puts in the world his signature on things to indicate to us. So very often red, for instance, is da means danger in, in the natural world. If you see like a spider with red on it, yeah, bad. Snake with red on it, bad. Um, and uh, poison is often uh, also red. So deadly nightshade. Um, a lot of berries, these red berries are poisonous. But, but you have things like carrots, which are good for the eye. So if you cut a carrot and look at it, it looks like an iris. So that's a signature. The kidney bean would be good for kidneys. Um, the uh, uh, cauliflower would be good for tumors. Uh, walnuts are literally in a, in a skull and look like the, the brain, the right and left side of the brain right, with the corpus callosum between the two. So that, that was a traditional belief. So cashews were considered good for memory. So they look almost identical to the, the, the part of the brain that, where the memory is. And Imam Siyulti actually said that cashews helped him. He had a phenomenal memory. And he said he ate a lot of cashews. So, <laughs> although uh, in, um, in Ta'lim uh, al-Muta'allam, he, he tells us that one of the benefits uh, for memory is 21 red raisins, which I think is just the exercise of remembering to do that every morning, right? Because people, if you, if you try it, it's actually not, I've, I've tried it. I've tried many memory things from these books. But um, if, if, if you do the, you'll, you'll have a hard time remembering like to get 21 red raisins every morning. So, and then he says the, the, uh, the tarjuman is the quwa natiqa. So the translator is, is, the, uh, is the, uh, the faculty, the, the rational faculty, the ability to produce language. And its tool is the tongue. And then the, 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 the katib, the one who writes for the king is the um, is the the faculty of writing and its tool is is the hand and the pen obviously and so the residents of this city are both good residents and and bad ones just like you have in any city good people and bad people hopefully the 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 good people outweigh the bad people but it can get to the point where there's more bad people than good people I mean there are places like that where you can't go because it's, it's so bad. I mean, it's, it's terrible, some, some of the places right now, uh, where, where there's just so many people that are thieves or murderers or rapists. And that often happens after war breaks down. So then he says that, So these are the faculties that uh, from them come uh, good character, beautiful behavior, and bad character, ugly behavior. So now he's going to, this is really interesting because what he's going to do is he's using, as, as he's taking these things that we understand at, at one level from the hadith and from the Quran, but he's going to the, apply them to the microcosm. So he's going to say, these meanings also apply to you. Like, um, you know, uh, Rumi said, when you read about Pharaoh in the Quran, don't, don't see Pharaoh as some historical figure. See the Pharaoh in yourself. Like, see the Pharaoh in yourself. So he's going to use this. So now he says that if the, the governor uh, is a good governor, once he takes command, and he... Uh, he basically governs the people with, the, with, with God's government, siyasati la. He will become the shade of God in the earth, just as it has been related from the Prophet ﷺ that governmental authority is the shade of God in the earth. And then it will be incumbent upon everyone. 
Everyone, it's incumbent upon them to obey him. كَمَا قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Obey God and obey the messenger and those put in, in power over you. So the Amr, the Prophet said there was no word for government in the time of the Prophet. He didn't use any of the terms that later came to term. He called it هَذَا Amr. So in the early period, it's always called هذا الأمر. لا نعطي هذا الأمر. And the Abbas is actually in their, in their writings, that's what they called it. It was the, uh, sorry, the uh, Umayyads. It was the Abbasids that introduced the state. And it's ironic because the, the meaning that the Abbasids intended was not state. It was revolution. Because... Dola means to revolve. Da, you know, Dala Yadulu, right? Mudawala. Dawala Yudawilu Muda Tirkalayam Nudawilu Habainanas. We move it amongst the people. In other words, it revolves. And so the Dola of the Abbasids was called a Dola Til Mubaraka, the blessed revolution. The the Abbasid the, the Umayyads called it Had al Amar. That was what they could be based on the prophetic. Uh, tradition. So now dola means state, but state in Latin is the opposite of dola. State is what's fixed, what doesn't change. It's status, like status quo. So the state is fixed, the dola is the idea. In, in Kuwait, to this day, over the, uh, when you go into the, the, the palace of the Kuwaiti ruler, it says, uh, li ghairika ma wasara ilayk. Like they put that over there as a reminder. If, if, if it had been continuous for the ones before you, it would have never reached you. In other words, it's a dola. And the hakim, one of the, the beauties of the pre-modern world, I mean, this is, and I think some of the Muslim rulers still have this. Certainly, the, the, like the kings, if you look at King uh, Muhammad or King uh, Abdullah, um, the, 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 the people that come out of these monarchical traditions that are aware, they have their children, and... But most rulers don't think about these things anymore. They think they're going to be in power forever, right? So, so when I was in the, the uh, I got a tour by um, Baroness Udin in England. She's one of the, the, um, the, the uh, people in the House of Lords because uh, they have elected lords and, or appointed by the government and then they have uh, lords that are, uh, inherit the position. So I... I she took me with a group. We went into the throne room. And there was this amazing clock that was given by the French king to the uh, English king. It was a few hundred years old. But it had the grim reaper on the top of the clock. And, and that wasn't a morbid thing. That was a reminder of the nature of time. And if you look at a lot of the, the early, because every city used to have these... Um, sundials and on the sundials they would have these latin phrases like carpe diem seize the day or you will be seized in one of these in one of these hours so people this is what they call moment momenti mori right is it's a reminder of death and it's something that pre-modern peoples they had reminders of death around them they wanted to be reminded of death because they didn't want to waste time they wanted their their lives to to mean something and so they had reminders of death and that's why, uh, you know, they had uh, like skeletons um, to, to remind them. Uh, Dr. Cleary in his office had a skeleton. I mean, not a big one, but a small one, but it was on his desk. Right? It's, it's a reminder that we're, we're, we're going to die. And, and, to, and to be aware of that is really important. So... So, uh, so then he says... Um, so obey Allah and obey the ruler, the messenger and the ruler. Those ul al-amri minkum. That's how I got to that. Had al-amr. Wa kadharik ma tajoo ila al-aqru sa'isan wa jaba ala sa'ir al-quwa an tuti'uhu. So when the reason becomes the governor, then it's it's an obligation on the rest of the faculties to obey it, to obey reason. Your quwa ghadabiya, your quwa shahwiya, all these different faculties should obey reason. Wa kama anna Allah ta'ala ja'ala nasa mutafawitin, kama nabha Allah ta'ala alihi bi qawlihi, wa rafa'na ba'dukum fawqa ba'din darajatin li yatakhida ba'duhum ba'dan sukhriya. So Allah says, we have made you uh, mutafawitun. 
So in other words, tafawut uh, is, is, you know, these, these differences in degrees and otherwise. So hierarchy is a type of tafawut. Um, some people, yatafawut, yafutuhu fi he He surpasses, uh, this person surpasses that person in his studies. He studies more. He gets up earlier. So there's always tafawut. And part of the, the, the modern world is this idea of leveling. This is something that was identified early on by people like Kierkegaard, uh, that, that they wanted to level everything, to make everything mediocre. So buildings are no longer, if you look at modern buildings, there's, there's nothing that really distinguishes them from other buildings. In the past, they, they, they were concerned about the aesthetic qualities. Now it's functional. Everything's functional. So, so this is, so, so he says that this tafawut amongst people, you know, this differing in degrees, is indicated by Allah's word, like that we raised some of you over others. You could interpret that we privileged some of you over others. Right? Darajats, by degrees. لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضَ سُخْرِيَ So, what's really interesting about sukhriya, right, with a dhamma, sikhriya, with a, a kasra is to exploit. If it, if it had sikhriya, it would be, but sukhriya is to use, to, 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 to gain benefit from another, right? But sukhriya can easily become sikhriya. And this is where you get the problem in hierarchical cultures. And this is why, like the communists, because of all the abuse, um, they easily convince those people that are being exploited that, oh, these are evildoers, we need to get rid of them and overthrow them. And this all comes from, from bad siyasa, from bad governance, that people aren't, when you're in a position, when you're in a privileged position, what are you going to do with your privilege? Are you going to use it as a source of abuse or are you going to use it for the betterment? of what's around you, which includes bettering your society, not just bettering yourself or bettering your family, but bettering the, the society, doing things that are useful. So this is really important because it's so an antithetical now to the modern world view, uh, uh, where, where they disdain outwardly. I mean, you have all these Marxists right here live, living in two million dollar homes and things like that, and then they vote for like Marxist but, but then when the criminals start encroaching, right, it's a nice word, encroachment, when they start encroaching on them, suddenly, like over in San Francisco, you know, when the billionaire gets stabbed, oh, better do something about crime, right? That, that's when the concern comes, when the billionaire gets stabbed, because suddenly it's affecting them. I mean, I, I, if you watch some of these people that, that uh, that are really disturbed about what's happening in academe right now because you have all these t teachers that are shocked by these students that are literally protesting in their classrooms. And they're so obtuse because they, they're not even aware that, that they created those students. That, and that's what Dostoevsky, that's why The Demons or The Possessed is such an important book to read because that's what he shows. You know, he's got this idiot who, who step on, who, who, he's just a complete idiot who has trained these kids that now have become nihilists and he, when they turn on, on, on the society he can't understand it. He created them. You created all these nihilistic, relativistic kids that r don't recognize any type of authority. You destroyed uh, authority by saying there's no such thing as authority. And then they become more susceptible to ideology than anybody else because the worst type of authority is the tyranny of an ideology. That is the worst type of authority, is the tyranny of an ideology. And, and that's what happens. They take on these ideologies that, that are then, like as Dostoevsky pointed out, they're really demons that have possessed them. The ideas are the demons. So you have all these people now out there uh, doing all these crazy things in the name of their ideological tyranny, the tyranny over their mind, because they can't even think. They've never been taught to think. Or to really question. They think they're questioning, but they're not. 
So this is this is a really important point that he's making, and 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 so so then he says, well, and in the same way in your own selves, in your own selves there are different faculties that have degrees in your own self. And so God has made it so that. That there's that min haqi kulli wahidatan that that it's it's the duty of every single one of the faculties antakuna uh, dakhiratan fi sultani mafoka to be subservient to the faculty that is above it. Like this is what he's saying that in your just like in society you want children that are o, 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 obedient to their parents, you want students that are are that show uh, respect to their elders, respect to their elders, which sometimes would mean obedience, obedience when it's appropriate. It doesn't mean you can't question things. You should if you have an intellect and you're an adult, but there's still decorum. There's still decorum. And so, so, so then he says, and, and to be in command of, of what is beneath it, in, in that faculty. What is subservient to it? So it is the duty of the appetitive uh, faculty to be subservient to the irascible faculty, the قوّة الغضبية, right? That, so, in other words, the genitals and the stomach should be subservient to the the the, the thumos, the spirited uh, nature of the chest, the heart. And it's the duty of the irascible soul to be in obedience to the rational soul, to the rational faculty. And it is the duty of the rational faculty to, to be illuminated by the light of, the, of, of sacred law. And in obedience to its dictates. So that the, these, the, the, they're working in common cause. These faculties now are working in common cause. They're not in opposition to one another. They're working to help one another. Mutadahira. كما قال الله تعالى ونزعنا ما في صدورهم من غل إخوانا على سرور متقابلين. So he uses this istimbat. It's a beautiful istimbat of of the idea of in in paradise when all of the resentment is removed from the hearts, they sit as in a fraternity on uh, on chairs facing on on couches facing one another. So what he's saying is that when 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 you are properly ordered. When, when your soul is properly ordered, then these faculties will be uh, in fraternity. They'll be helping one another, not hindering one another. And then he says, You can never be without a world that doesn't have evil doers that want to introduce corruption and trouble into the world. And they will oppose the virtuous. Just like that, we put in every city the big criminals plotting away in it. So every city, you usually see their clubs when you come into the city. I'm just kidding. Like, you know, those Freemasons. <laughs> so he, he says that they're in. Every city, Allah says, they're plotting away the evildoers. And like that, we made for every prophet an enemy of human and spirit demons. So the, the demonic realm is both human and spirit. And the human demons are worse because they're in alliance with the demonic realm, the principalities of darkness in high places that uh, Romans talks about. You know, our, our war, war is not a war of flesh and blood, but of principalities of darkness, right? Of powers in high places. So th that's, who, that's who is opposed to us. That's, they're opposed to righteousness in every time and place. And, and they will introduce facade. 
and sow corruption. And there you can see it now, what they're doing. It's amazing how they're turning everything upside down. Just look around you, what's happening. This is not normal, but it's because they have lost any religious grounding for their civilization. And once you lose religious grounding, Iblis is there to provide all the alternatives. He's there to provide all the alternatives. Because it's revelation that roots a people in reality. And once you lose revelation, it's hawa, is what roots them in uh, falsehood and illusion. So, so just like you have these evildoers in every city, you have in the human being you have these low faculties, these foul faculties, والشهوة, والحسد, envy, الفساد, and they're seeking corruption and trouble, and they will oppose reason and intelligence, deliberation. ولا يصغي الى الاشرار ولا يعتمدهم كما قال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تتخذوا بطانة من دونكم وكما قال الله تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى اولياء بعضهم اولياء بعض ومن يتولهم منكم فانه منهم ان الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين وقال تعالى ونحكم بينهم بما انزل الله ولا تتبع اهواءهم واحذرهم so he says, just like the, the governor has to follow the truth and should not listen to the evildoers in his kingdom, nor rely upon them, just as Allah has said, O oh, you who believe, do not take as, a, uh, as an inner counsel uh, those who, who don't want good. And Allah says, O oh, you who believe, do not take uh, the, the Jews or the Christians as allies. Right? This is so sometimes wrongly translated as friends. It means protecting allies. The wali is the one who protects. And so don't take them as, because they're protecting frienders, friends one of another, like the Christians protect the Jews. So, but they, they, don't, they, won't, they don't protect the Muslims. So this is, this is really to Muslim governments and things like that. that, that you, it's, it's like when, you, uh, you know, when, when Lawrence went to Arabia and convinced the Sharif of Mecca that the British wanted to establish an uh, a Arab state for them. But they, they had one condition, just help us get rid of your brothers, the Ottomans. And so they allied with them, with the British. And in the end, it was all a lie. They never planned on giving them any state. They just used them. And so that was a warning that had they listened to this verse, that that wouldn't have happened. They, they would have never blown up the, uh, the railway. Because they couldn't defeat the Basha in Medina. He protected the city. But what they did, they ended up blowing up the railroad so they couldn't get the, the, um, the help from them. So then he says... This chapter is a very important chapter. Uh, so then he says, um, that you should judge with what God has revealed to you and don't, um, so then he says, whoever takes them as allies is from them uh, and, and Allah does not guide uh, wrongdoing folk. So then he says uh, to, to, uh, to judge by what has been revealed to you and do not follow your passions and beware of them that because they will seduce you into leaving some of what God has revealed to you. And if you turn away, know uh, Right? that God will afflict them with some of what their sins have wrought. And many people are profligate, are people that are outside of virtue. And, and he says the same with the in, intelligence and with uh, your, your, uh, your thinking should not rely upon these lower faculties. Don't think with your stomach, don't think with your genitals. I mean, we, you know, 
There, there's been presidents that, that that's what they were thinking with, you know, and, and then they end up uh, just becoming completely compromised because they're, they're, they're Abdul Hawa. وَكَمَا أَنْ يَجِبُ أَنَّهُ يَجِبُ عَلَى الْوَارِ أَنْ يُجَاهِدَ عَدَاءَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كما قال تعالى وأعد لهم ما استطعتم من قوة ومن رباط الخيل ترهبون به عدو الله وعدوكم وكذلك يجب على العقل أن يجاهد الهوى فإن الهوى من عداء الله بدلالة قول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما عبد في الأرض معبود أبغض إلى الله من الهوى ثم ترى قوله تعالى أفرأيت من اتخذ من اتخذ إله هوى وكما وكما أن من استحوذ عليه الشيطان وأنساه ذكر الله كما قال الله تعالى استحوذ عليهم الشيطان فأنساهم ذكر الله وكذلك العقل إذا استحوذ عليه الهوى So just as the governor must fight the enemies of the Muslims, the ruler uh, and Allah says in the Quran prepare for them what you're able to of quwa it's nakira, quwa, all types of power intellectual power, military power uh, economic power, right? Women ribat al khayl, and and those things necessary for uh, war preparation. Like countries have defense budgets for that reason. So ribat al khayl is is it has that meaning. Uh, and the Prophet said, "Ada wa hiya rimaya, quwa is rimaya, which is basically now it's rockets, right? I mean, in his time it was arrows. But rimaya is the ability to shoot from a distance. So guns are a type of rimaya." So then, then it said, "Torhibuna bihi adu Allahi wa aduwakum." So they, they, you know, they translate that as to ter- put terror, but it it means deter. And if you look at the root, the Latin root of deter, it's de terere, out of fear. That's what a deterrent is. That's why having a strong military budget deters people from attacking you, out of fear. So that's that's a really important distinction. So, and like that, the intelligence has to fight his, uh, the passion because the passion is one of the enemies of God. And the proof of that is the Prophet ﷺ said, nothing is worshipped on the earth more odious to God uh, than uh, passion, hawa, all the desires, right, the low desires. And, and then Allah says, have they not seen the one who took as a God his desires? And just as shaitan, take, take, if shaitan takes control of a human being, he, he makes that human being forget the remembrance of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, استحوذ عليهم الشيطان فأنساهم ذكر الله Shaitan took uh, over and they forgot the remembrance of God. And that's why there's so much demonic influence in our culture now because God is not remembered. The churches are empty. People don't remember God. They don't even say grace. People used to say grace when they ate. We have the hadith of the fat shaitan and the skinny shaitan. If you, if you don't bless the food you eat, you, you're empowering your shaitan, giving him uh, caloric strength in the, in the, in the unseen realm. وَكَمَا أَنُّ يَجِبُ عَلَى الْوَارِي أَنْ يُسَالَمْ أَعَادِيَهُ إِذَا لَمْ يَقْوَ عَلَيْهِمْ this is very interesting. So he's saying also the governor has to make peace with his enemies if he's not capable of fighting them. So that's a smart ruler, like the Begums of Bhopal. Right? These were women that ruled the, the, the Indian state of Bhopal. And when they had the Sepoy Rebellion, the only Muslim group they didn't have any casualties were, were in Bhopal because the Begum there did not permit the, the scholars to support the rebellion because she said that the British were too strong. So she, it was out of her wisdom that she did that. And was, they're really interesting, those women that ruled uh, Bhopal. There are actually pictures of uh, the, one of the Begums when the Viceroy of England came. She's in full purda and she's meeting the... But she had ministers and she ruled the country. She was very... Uh, uh, very adept at what she was doing. So, 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 so then he says, you know, that Allah says, if they incline towards peace, you should incline towards peace. And, and not, uh, not to uh, incline towards them. When salamhum, even if you're at peace with them, don't rely on them. Do not 
Do not rely on those who are wrongdoers uh, because you will be afflicted by the fire. The feather is sebebiya. So it'll cause you to, because you do that, it'll cause you to be afflicted by the fire. And also, the intelligent person has to work with his self also. There's a kind of, um, you know, musalama, like a, 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 a peace treaty between these faculties if he's not capable. He's going to go into uh, detail about that, but I think uh, I'm being told the time is up, so I'm going to stop there. But the next section is very, very interesting. So, Because um, he's going to give an analogy of how to, to get out of being a victim of your own self. Because most people really are victims of their own selves. So, any, uh, any questions? Mm-hmm. Tfaddal. Musab. Um, so I had a question on um, the last class you mentioned um, about how it's always um, better to get closer to your Lord through his ihsan rather than through um, trials. And there's also um, the idea that, um, you know, it's uh, God will, like, if you fail to get to God through his ihsan, then he will bring you to him through trialing. Right. So I was just wondering, how do we reconcile that with um, the, idea, the idea that the prophets, all the prophets, the, first, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and um, the, all the walis, they go through the hardest trials, and the principle that um, God loves those whom he trials. Right. Well, and they're not mutually uh, contradictory. Like, when you're in a good state, you should be, because people tend to forget God when they're in good states. So what he's saying is, is that when you're in a good state, that's when you should be, the Prophet ﷺ was always with God. So, so whether, whether he's in tribulation or whether he's in, in, uh, in, in, in ni'mah, blessings, he's with God. Whereas a lot of people forget God when things are going well. And the Quran has many verses about that. They forget God when things are going well. So the Sahaba said they, they were, they, the times of tribulation, they always felt secure in them because they knew that blessings were coming. Whereas when they were in blessings, they felt less secure because they knew tribulation followed it. But the point is when you're in the blessing is to be aware of it, right? If you're in blessing, guard it because, and that's why, you know, man, 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 man shakara ni'amuhu qayyadaha bi'iqaliha, you know, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَشْكَرِ اللَّهِ عَلَى نِعْمِهِ تَعْرَضِ لِزَوَالِهَا That if you're not grateful when you have the blessings, then you're exposing them to losing the blessing. So the tribulations are, I mean, dunya is a dar of bala. But there's always blessings, in, in the, there's always ihsan. Even in the blessings, uh, even in the tribulations, there's ihsan. There's always ihsan. I mean, uh, Ibn Abbas said in every tribulation, there's three blessings that you should be aware of. Uh, it could be worse than what it is. Somebody loses a hand, they could have lost both hands. They lose an eye, they could have lost both eyes. Right? Uh, that it's... Um, it's in your, the dunya, it's in your worldly matters and not in your religious matters because that's the real tribulation is in, is in the deen. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْ مُصِيبَتَنَا فِي دِينِنَا In other words, we know we're going to have masaib in the dunya, but don't make it in our deen. Make it in our dunya if you're going to give us those tribulations. And then the third one is that it's in this world and not in the next world because the real calamities are in the next world. So the... the uh, you know, what he meant by that, مَنْ لَمْ يُقَادْ إِلَى اللَّهِ بِالْإِحْسَانِ قِيدَ إِلَيْهِ بِالْسَلَاسَرِ مِتِحَانِ He's just saying that if, if the ihsan doesn't bring you to God, just know that you're going to be brought to God with tribulations. You're going to be brought to God. So, so but there's always tribulations. Is that, is that clear? Um, so, in in the chapter that we just covered, the author Imam Raghib Asfahani, he 
has a specific order. He says, you know, Quwa Shahwiya, and then it's Mu'tamira to the Quwa Ghadabiyya, and then Quwa Ghadabiyya to the Aqila. Yeah. Quwa Aqila. So, what is the, but he doesn't go into details to the reasoning as to why the Shahwiya is specifically uh, supposed to be obeying. Or, oh, good point. Yeah. So, nice, what is nice. the reasoning yeah. behind the it? The reasoning behind that, because if we go, if we look at it from Dar al Mafasid with Jalb al Masalih, Dar al Mafasid muqaddam ala Jalb al Masalih. So, so you have to. You always ward off harm. You you would you you would ward off harm before you would accrue benefit. So the purpose of the shahwa is to accrue benefit. The purpose of the quwa al ghadbiya is to ward off harm. And so whenever the quwa shahwiya is going to do its appetite is going to harm the person, it has to obey the 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 faculty that protects the person from harm. Got it? But it's a good question. Uh, go ahead, sister. Sorry, I'm I'm looking over here, so I'm I'm not ignoring you guys. Assalamualaikum. Um, could you just repeat the saying that you said, "Lo dama li ghairika"? Yeah, "Lo dama li ghairika lama lama wasara ilayk." You know, had had it had it uh, had it uh, continued. You know, had it had a permanence for those before you, it would not have reached you. Yeah. It's a famous, it was, I think, from one of the, the caliphs in, you know, a thousand years ago. So the, the Kuwaiti ruler had, I don't know which one had, he had it put on there as a reminder, which is good. It's a momenta, a momenti mori. Tadlal Dehya. Yesterday you mentioned um, the intellect relates to the salvific path and the path of sanctification and um, you said that the path of sanctification is, is an arduous path um, so I was wondering if there's a connection between um, taking on that path and you know sort of in the traditional world people went through these rites of passages and they had like initi initiatic moments um, so maybe there was a connection between the two I mean traditionally the people would would uh, you know find a teacher who was somebody who had done done that journey, and uh, and was in a in a uh, in a position to help that person on their path, and those traditionally they were they were the 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 scholars who acted according to their knowledge. They they had they had tahqiq, uh, you know, the muhaqiqun. Uh, so, in in these latter days that we're in, you know, I mean by by the ninth century already, uh, scholars were bemoaning the fact that these people didn't really exist anymore. Um, Ahmed Zarruq called it al uh, Kibrit al Ahmar is sometimes what is called the red sulfur, which was the alchemist um, material that transmutes lead into gold. Like the, in other words, your your toxic soul that that, that person would help you. They, they were a spiritual alchemist who would trans, help you transmute your soul from a toxic state to a purified state. Uh, Ahmed Zarok says, Wa huwa uh, th These people. So the best thing is just to find good, good teachers that, that are um, you know, humble and, and have learned, hopefully in, you know, in chains as well. It's, it's not an absolute requisite. Uh, Imam Siyulti mentions that. Um, as, lo as long as they're qualified to be teaching. Uh, and, and, they, and then the, you know, the signs are pretty clear. They should follow one of the rightly guided schools um, and then not have any bid'ah. Now, who determines what that is? Well, hopefully it's the schools that do that. So part of the problem now is that we, we have... Um, you know, there, there's been a breakdown of all these things. So we're in a, a time of what they call enomy in sociology. And it's just a time where things have broken down. And so it's very difficult for people. And a lot of people are grappling. But in these latter days, the Prophet Sallallahu said that there would be a lot of leniency. If you adhere to one-tenth of what the Prophet brought, then you'll, you'll be saved. Whereas the Sahaba had to follow the, all, all of it. 
Um, and that's not to say, you know, any compromise on the foundational things like the five pillars. That's not in any way. But in other words, you know, these are difficult times. And the Prophet Sallallahu said about his Ikhwan, he said Ikhwani, he, he was like yearning for his brothers and sisters. I mean, it's understood in the, in the language of the Arabs. Um, and, and, and they asked him who they were. And he said, there will be people that come towards the latter days. He said, they, they would do anything if they could see me. And, and, and then he, and he said, they will have the reward of 50 uh, people. And they said, 50 to us? And he said, yes. And he said, how, how is, they couldn't understand. They said, how is that? And he said, لَكُمْ أَعْوَانٌ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ وَلَيْسَ لَهُمْ أَعْوَانٌ you have lots of helpers. In other words, the whole society is facilitating. Like when I lived in West Africa, everybody prayed to Hajjud. It was just normal. Like the whole, the whole village, you heard people reciting Quran at, at 3, 4 in the morning, every morning. So that, 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 uh, to grow up in a society like that, it's, it's facilitating for you. But if you're living in a society where everything is distracting you from God, and yet you're doing your best to remain uh, present with God, your reward is going to be, uh, inshallah, it's, it'll be immense. So, so I mean, I, I, I've told this story before, but it was a very profound, uh, for me, it really had an impact on me where, where, with, with this stewardess. I was with Muhammad al-Awadi, the Kuwaiti um, intellectual. He's a brilliant Kuwaiti man. And we were flying together, and there, and there was a, a, a stewardess and um, I can't remember how it came up, but um, he asked her about, um, about how she felt about having to serve wine. And, and she said, I always serve it with my left hand. You know, I mean, I don't know. I just, Allah is arham ar rahimin she's, she, she's doing something. To, to recognize this is Najasa. You know, and that, that really had an impact on me. Just, it's just a hard time for people. You know, and, and a lot of these people come from places where there's not a lot of, I mean, you guys are so privileged, like the, the privilege that we have in this country. And I'm talking about all the way down, because poor people in this country are like rich people in places I've lived at. You know, but we're a very spoiled people. Because people, I mean, there's so many people that, that uh, their lives are, are dictated by circumstances that are so beyond the pale of what we could imagine in terms of hardship. Because we haven't experienced those things. At least most of us. I mean, Freydun has. Freydun, you know, I mean, he was a refugee of a war. They crossed the border fleeing Afghanistan into Persia. He had to... You know, and he comes from a very, the Mujaddidi family, these were the notables of Afghanistan. They're one of the uh, aristocratic families of Afghanistan, descendants of Ahmed Sir Hindi, descendants of Omar uh, Farooq, you know. But they, they, they lost everything and had to come, and then they come to America. You know, so there's, there's a lot of people like that in this country that are immigrants, but people that, that grew up here, they don't know what that's like. You know, you see people, you don't know what they've been through. Uh, so, uh, I'm being asked to remind all of you about Ramadan giving and also the 12K. Uh, we really need uh, people to sign up. We hope you just, it's not much, a dollar a day. Keep shaitan away, inshallah. Yeah, online questions. Did some? I think there was some before we go there. Did anybody hear? Yeah, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Last week you mentioned people that are spiritually deluded um, on their spiritual state, and yesterday we mentioned the ayah of those who can't see, can't hear. Mm -hmm. um, so can you please share some advice on what we can do to make sure we're not of those people? Well, I think all of us are going to have blind spots. All of us are going to have some levels of, you know, delusion. I think it's part of the human condition. Um, 
if the veils were lifted, most of us, as Imam al-Ghazali says, you know, if the veils were lifted, we would be wandering the forest saying, Subhanallah. <laughs> you know, we, we, so, so there's a blessing in, 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 in having, you know, the veils that Allah has placed upon us. But, but we should ask Allah at least to, you know, أريني الحق حقا ورزقني اتباعا وأريني الباطر باطرا ورزقني اجتنابا. I mean, that's a really... It's one of my favorite du'as. I actually was asked to write in a multi-faith book on people's favorite prayers, and I think that's the one that I put from the Prophet ﷺ because it's such a comprehensive thing to show me the truth as truth and then give me the ability to follow it because there's a lot of people that see the truth and they don't follow it. And show me falsehood as falsehood because a lot of people see falsehood as truth and give me the ability to avoid it. So we just ask Allah and like I said, prayer on the Prophet is a really powerful way of uh, to, to do prayer on the Prophet him to remember the Prophet him to try to implement, take on sunan slowly, but, but take them on. Try to do the different sunan throughout your life. Just add, you know, just add sunan and try to keep them as prophetic practices. The occasional prayers that we just did, um, those are really beautiful ways of just remembering God, and they're not easy to practice. I mean, as somebody who really does try to practice them as much as possible, that you forget, you know, you, and sometimes you remember afterwards, you forget. Sometimes you go into the, uh, the, the water closet, as, the, as they say in Europe, you know, and forget to, you know, put your uh, left foot first and then say, when you come out, right foot first. I mean, those, those things, you know, are be becoming mindful, right? Becoming a dhakir. And, and they're, they're really powerful ways of just becoming more present. And the more you do that, the closer you get to following the sunnah of the Prophet the less delusional you're going to be. Uh, and that, and that, I really believe that, you know. And then his compassion is really important because a lot of people have these outward sunan and they don't have the inward sunan, which is a big problem, <laughs> right? Just to have the, 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 uh, the inward sunan of humility and, uh, and, and also shafaqa, rahma. I mean, he's rahmatan lil alameen. He's, he's the mercy to all the worlds, to the animal, the vegetable, the mineral. He was, he's a mercy to all of the worlds. Online question. We've been talking about the intellect, but what about the heart? How does one know if they are acting based on their heart or their intellect? Well, I mean, it's a good question. They're, they're not, the heart in our tradition is the intellect. So there's a khilaf about the, where the heart, uh, uh, the intellect is centered. Is it the brain? That was Abu Hanif's opinion. The other three imams said it's actually the physical heart. We know now in neuroscience that there are definitely connections between the brain and the heart. Um, the heart is an amazing organ. The fact that it, it's independent of the central nervous system. I mean, it's quite amazing that it has this, uh, you know, these organs have an independence that you can actually have an organ transplant. You can have somebody else's heart, and 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 it will be functioning uh, for you. And then there, there's the all or nothing. You know, the heart has this all or nothing law, right? It, it it's either going to going to go uh, fire or it won't or it won't. It's an all or nothing organ. So the the the, the intelligence of the heart is real. You know, ask your heart, even if people give you fatwa. Ask your heart. There's a real truth to heart intelligence. And a lot of people are cut off from their hearts. Mm. What we would call, like, um, there's a certain type of intelligence that is, you know, it's the intelligence of, of somebody who would, you know, when, when a scientist who, when, they, when, when, when they're, they develop uh, the napalm bomb, you know, the napalm bomb, and, and, then, and then they find out, oh, that the Viet Cong are actually building ponds in their villages, so when the, when the bombs come down, they can go into the water because the napalm was diffused by water, so it wouldn't burn them once they got into the water. So then they developed waterproof napalm. That, that, is, that has nothing to do with the heart. 
But obviously somebody had to think to be able to do that. So that's thought completely cut off from the heart because no real human being could do that. They, they would resign. There's no human being that could do that. That's a demon. That's a shaitan al-ins that would do that. And the same with the neutron bomb. Neutron bomb was developed here, like right down the road. And it was developed to kill all the Arabs and leave all their uh, oil installations intact. So it's like a, a bomb that doesn't destroy any of the infrastructure. Anybody that could do that is a demon. Aerial bombardment is demonic. The Prophet ISM would have never sanctioned anything like that. It's demonic. Non-discriminatory killing like that. I mean, battles are battles, but... And that's why the Prophet said towards the latter days, he just said, break your swords and break your bows. When are, you, when, when are those going to be applied, those hadith? People just think the Prophet said them for no reason. I mean, I'll defend my house, but I don't know, a nuclear war, I'd rather go with the first blast. I don't want to be around for the, for the aftermath. And these idiots, I mean, they're, they're walking into World War III because they're really not smart people. And I've been around enough of them to know that firsthand. They're not bright people. I mean, we had genius people, highly educated people that fell into World War I and II. These people are of a different... Um, they're just not that bright. And you, and you can... You can just tell when they speak. And that's what you know, Allah says, you'll know them by the subtext of their words. They, they can't even speak properly. And, you know, if two people speak, you know the veterinarian from the, the human physician <laughs> based on what they say. So, you know, we, I mean, we should be praying because it's crazy times. I mean, what's happening in Taiwan is very serious. And 90% of the most sophisticated ships in the world are made in Taiwan. If, you know, if Taiwan goes, and they, they, they'll detonate all those factories. They're not going to let the Chinese get those factories. They're trying to build the factories here right now, the chips, because they, they outsourced everything, and now they realize there's this major security risk. So, you know, pe people, people have to just really, you know, I mean, whatever comes, comes, you know, it's, 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 it's all from God and we, we have to accept that. But humans, you know, hu humans, uh, if, if, they're, if they're not in this tradition, they're very dangerous. So, so the, you know, for us, the heart and the intellect are, they're the same. They have hearts, but they don't, they don't understand with them. So. And obviously it's not the physical heart, you know. I mean the Prophet said, Allah So this mudra is there, right? A lump of flesh. So if if it's sound, the whole body is sound. If it's corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. So that's the physical heart, but he was ana analogizing it to the spiritual heart. That if the spiritual heart is sound, then the soul is sound. If the spiritual heart is unsound, then the, the soul is corrupt. So, so um, yeah. We have uh, one more question that says, how can one analyze oneself deeply without overthinking and following into OCD? Yeah, that's a, that's a you know, Ahmed Zarruq, identified uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, he said that waswasa, which is when people have doubts, a lot of self-doubt, he said it's either jahnun bis sunnah or khabarun fil aqal. It's either ignorance of the sunnah, like in wudu, you ignore waswasa in wudu. And in the prayer, if you're what's called a muwaswis, which is somebody that has constant waswasa, you ignore it and you just do the badi. Um, so, so, so that's the way you treat a kind of obsessive compulsive is, is, is to ignore it. Um, but the, uh, I think, you know, humans, especially modern people, you know, overthink a lot. I think that 
earlier people, like Mauritanians to me, very fitra people, and I just noticed they just did not obsess about the self. <laughs> you know, it's just, I think Africans tend to be much more fitra people generally, and, and I think they see a lot of this as, I mean, they, they might not use the word, but for want of a better word, it's just a kind of neuroses. You know, it's just people are too obsessed with themselves. And you need to get out of yourself. And the best way to do that is serve. You know, service is really, the Prophet said, Sayyidat Qawm Khadimahum. The Prophet ﷺ was a constant servant. He was a servant prophet. He could have been a king prophet, but he chose to be a servant prophet. He was a servant prophet. He constantly served. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and uh, so I think people just need to get out of themselves more and not obsess about themselves so much. Self-loathing is not good. Make toba, whatever you did. If you've been, you know, watching things you shouldn't have seen, like a lot of, I know a lot of young people watching, uh, just stop and then make toba and, and don't go back to it. And don't put yourself in a position where you're compromised. You know, put your computer in a, in, in a place where everybody in the house can see it. Don't go on it when you're alone in your room. If you, if you can't control yourself, I mean, hopefully you can control yourself. But if you can't, do things that protect you. Um, and then just make toba. Allah accepts toba, And don't obsess about, oh, did he accept it or not? We should believe that he accepts our toba. We, shouldn't, we, shouldn't, uh, we, we should have a good opinion of our Lord. الحمد لله سبحانك اللهم نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وتوب إليك ونعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا صالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم أقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول بيننا وبين معصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغ به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا أبدا ما أحييتنا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ومنصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا غاية ربتنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا, لا يرحمنا ولا يخافك فينا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المصيب الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى Bismillah. Just wanted to also announce to everyone that there will be class this Friday. So session seven will be this Friday at 5 p.m. And also the book club will be Sunday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Yeah, just uh, inshallah, I'm not going to be able to finish the book, but what I am going to do is, some of the chapters, I think, are less, they're all important, but some are less central to his thesis. So I am going to try to do those chapters and, and, and do the last two chapters, which are, to me, just incredible uh, testimonies to the genius of the man, but also the, the, the beauty of our tradition. Um, and so I, I, I'm hoping to do that. That's, that's why I added one on Friday. And then I, if I don't get through what I want to, I might add another one next week before the end of the thing. All right, so, barakallahu <laughs> alaykum.